Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God, for bringing us together in this moment, Lord. God, I just pray that your message would come out, God, that God, that whatever you seek in this moment, that your will would be done through our interaction tonight, through this computer, God. And God, thank you so much for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. So we're continuing our study in the book of Genesis. I forgot to do my hair. <laughs> continuing our study in the book of Genesis. In a quick little recap so far, we did chapter one, when God created everything. Chapter two, we got into his creation of man, but also his tasking us with a mission. God gave us a mission to keep and to work the ground, the garden rather, to protect it and to, to till it, to work it. So he called us to be in direct servitude to him. So from the beginning of our creation, we were called to serve God, but God gave us freedom and responsibility in that servitude. And that's the beautiful part that we're going to get into tonight. Let me try to fix this angle a little bit. Nope, that's all right. You just get to see my double chin all night. <laughs> Lose weight. That's the solution to that one. <laughs> all right, so let's get into the Word of God. We're going to be in chapter 2 verses 16 through the end of the chapter, which is 25. So I'm going to read it and then we'll break it down. A little quick prelude from verse 15. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. All right. Verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. The Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found corresponding to him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. Interesting stuff. So in verse 16, what stuck out to me was three words. You are free. So let's break it down again. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden. You are free. So from the beginning, God's first direction to us, it was a command. This is something we have to follow. His first direction, you are free. We as Christians, if whoever's watching is a Christian, we as Christians, we have become free from the enslavement of sin, but we've become slaves to Christ. What does that mean for someone who's not Christian? It means that once I stop, you know, 
running solely on my own desire and doing everything I want to do for myself at all situations. Once I stop doing that and turn from that and start trying to say, well, is this true? What is in this Bible? And it, it, does it make sense to me and my life? And as you start reading it, you see that it, it really does make sense. And as you start hearing it more and more, you realize Jesus was a man of integrity. You don't have to be a Christian to look at the life of Jesus and say, that is a man that I would want to be like. That's a man that I would want to emulate. That is someone that I would want to call my friend. That is someone who I would want to be there for me when I'm down. I would want someone who says, come to me, you who are weary, and I will give you rest. He says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is light. He says, I'm lowly. I'm humble at heart. That's Jesus Christ. He said for, and that, that's uh, Matthew chapter 11, by the way. He says, for I have not, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, he says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That scripture, that second little part doesn't make sense to people until you understand what Jesus did. But the servitude, the spirit of service. For those of you who don't know, Jesus Christ is literally God born in the flesh as a human. And that is that um yeah what do you call it or let, let, let me back up god himself on earth as his own creation came to us in service and so he called us to be of service to him right away and it's nothing that he wouldn't do himself but listen to what he says to us you are free well when we come to christ and we turn from that sinful nature that that direction that leads to not favorable stuff in our life. Let me ask you this question. I'm going to finish this thought and let me ask you this question. When we turn from that sinful way, when we turn from the stuff that's causing destruction and harm in our lives and the lives of our loved ones and strangers, when we turn from those things and start trying to focus on the life of Jesus and the integrity that he had when he was here. And when we look at that as an example, when we start following his example, we have no longer been held captive to the throes of sin, which is from the enemy. We're no longer being held captive by our enemy, our common enemy. Now we've become slaves to Christ. Wait, what? Sla yes, enslaved. But the word there is a bondservant. We become a bond servant to Christ. Well, what does that mean? It means that I choose to be a servant to Christ. I choose to call him my master. I want him to be the master of my life. That's a bond servant. I've chosen that I want to be a servant of Christ. So that's the joy we have is that, yes, we become slaves of christ but it's a bond servant it's that i've chosen willingly to call him my master he is god after all but i have freedom i have freedom but let me ask you a question and then i'm going to go back to this this freedom because i want to get into that really quickly let me ask you this question the things that a Christian or the Bible would say is sin, right? The word, the catchphrase that'll turn somebody the other direction, sin. It's funny because it should turn us the right direction, but sin. Let me ask you this. For those of you who don't like that word and you don't want to hear what I'm saying about Christ or the Bible or anything, please listen. The things that are called sin in the Bible, drunkenness, sexual immorality, um, you know, wrath, 
oh gosh, I mean, it's just the, the, the list goes on, but you know, stealing, I mean, all these things that I'm, I'm trying to make it basic, right? So anybody can, can grab onto it. Have those things ever brought you a favorable outcome in the long run? That's my question. Have they ever brought you a favorable outcome? We say, oh yeah, well, oh yeah, you know, having that, that girl, this and that, it was great. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. But what happened after that? What was the result? Sin is fun for a season. It wouldn't be tempting if it wasn't. Sin is fun for us for a time. And then it brings consequences. And some of those consequences are very heavy. So my question still remains. The things that the Bible says are sin. Have they ever brought you favorable consequences? Well, no, it was the cop's fault that pulled me over when I was drunk. The cop gave me a ticket. The court gave me a DUI. What are you talking about? You were drunk, right? I'm not speaking to anyone in particular. I'm just saying like, until we're able to stop looking everywhere else at the stuff we're doing, we're never going to understand the problem. And the problem is, God loves us so deeply and yet we completely reject him because we want to continue doing the things that feel good to us, but bring harmful consequences. I'm going to stay it again and slow it down. The problem is that God loves us so much, but we keep doing our own thing, causing harm to ourselves and others. And therefore we lose sight of the importance of having that freedom that God gave us as, as people. In the beginning, when they were walking around in, in, the, in the Garden of Eden, in paradise, there was no shame. It said right there in verse 25, both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. There was no shame. There was, there was nothing wrong. There was just paradise. In fact, as we read, God brought each creature to Adam and and. Whatever Adam named it, that's what it was called. That's what the Bible says. God brought him the lion and Adam said, lion. God brought him the elephant. Elephant, right? Giraffe, parrot, peacock, right? He brought all these birds and everything he brought to Adam. Tiger, you know, oh, that's a leopard. That's a, that's a snow leopard. He brought all of these amazing creations, everything that was a living creature, the Bible says, but none of them corresponded to him. But I'm going to get back to that. I'm going ahead of myself. Let's get back to this freedom. When he says you are free. Well, listen, we have some responsibility there because when we go to first Corinthians chapter 10 verses 23 and 24, A man named Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth that he had started years prior when he was first going around telling people about Jesus Christ in the very beginning. And as he's writing to them, they're talking to him about idolatry and they're talking to him about people are saying we shouldn't eat this, this meat that was sacrificed to idols and we shouldn't be, you know, acting this way. And he's saying, look, Verse 23, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. That's verse 23. Verse 24, no one is to seek his own good, but the good of the other person. What did Jesus say? He said, love um, each other as I have loved you. That's what he said. The whole purpose, guys, what we're here to do is to love each other and encourage each other and bring each other up so that when we stand face to face with the Lord, we stand justified in God's eyes and we stand righteous in his presence for all our mistakes and all of our imperfections here in this physical earthly body right now. For all of these things, we build each other up and we love our fellow. And we care for each other. And that is where the freedom 
can be detrimental because if we say, oh, well, I'm free to do as I please, are the things you're doing going to cause someone else harm? He says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Sure, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden except for that one. Because if you eat that fruit on that day, you will certainly die. He says, this will not be beneficial for you. But what gets deeper is when we get into chapter three, when Eve eats the fruit and then Adam sees that she ate the fruit and she brings it to him. He loves her so much that he knows her destination. He knows what has just happened. And he loves her too much to leave her alone. And he eats and, and protects and stays with his wife, knowing fully well the consequence. But he wasn't going to leave her alone. But he says, but this will not build you up. Satan in the garden told Eve, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Your eyes will be opened. So he told her, this will build you up. But it was a lie. Because God said, don't do that. Of all the trees, just prior in verse 9 or something of Genesis chapter 2. He, he says, God made every tree that is pleasing to the appearance. He's literally said every tree. God formed from the ground every single tree. And of all of the trees, he said, just don't eat the fruit from one tree. And Satan said, go ahead and eat that fruit. It will build you up. Well, it was a lie because it says everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. You could take that fruit, but it will not build you up. For on that day, you will certainly die. And that's what happened. When we ate that fruit, sin entered humanity and therefore so did death because the penalty of sin is death. So when God said, you will certainly die, that's exactly what happened. He didn't physically die in that moment. Adam, when I say he, Adam didn't physically die in that moment, but death was now, he was on a clock. There was a time clock clicking. Look, this is heavy stuff, okay? So we're going to catch up on one other thing on this same thought process. When God said he didn't see a helper suitable or corresponding to Adam. He brought all the creatures to him and, and we got to take part in this creation process and, and name everything and be a part of God's kingdom. In fact, the head of the kingdom, as far as what's been happening on earth up to this point, but nobody was suitable. So God took a rib made Eve, I'm not going to get into that hole, but there's a great study about why did he take a bone from the side and not the head or the foot? You know, you can kind of see where something like that might go, right? We hold our, our partner close. But the point is, the two became one flesh. So along the point of everything is per permissible, there's freedom, right? You are free, God said. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Listen, listen to this. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Just like chapter 10, right? Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Take that verse again. Every, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. I can do anything, but I will not let it master me. So I know if I'm going to put my eyes on something that is going to then take my thoughts and then pretty much essentially control my actions to take me captive. That's a problem. And that's when he says, yes, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. I will not be mastered by sin. He said, food is for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will do away with both of them. However, the body, now listen to this. This is where the man and the woman become one flesh. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. He's talking directly about 
the resurrection of Christ. Don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? So should I take part of Christ's body and make it a part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For the scripture says, the two will become one flesh. But anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. Sexual immorality. When you have sex with someone, you are connected with that person forever. And that should get us to think twice when we're straying from our spouse. When we want to stray from our spouse, when we think there's some sort of fulfillment that we can get outside of that sexual communion between the man and a woman in a marriage covenant. God says, you, you are free, but if you do that, you're desecrating my Holy Spirit that I've placed inside you. You're here to glorify me. Why? So that people can come to me. Why? Because I will give them rest for their souls. God is the way. He's the way. God is the answer to all problems that there are. Is God. Because God is love and he is spirit. And he brings a peace that surpasses all understanding. When God fills your heart... You no longer fear. There is no, no need for hatred, racism. Uh, you know, look, there is just no need for people to hate each other for any reason. If God is in their heart. It's just ludicrous. You're like, what are you talking about? Like. God made all of us, even the people that I don't favorably get along with for various personally, emotional, intimate reasons. I don't wish any harm on anyone because God created those people. And if God created them just like me, God sees them as a finished work and God created them with a purpose. And God created all of us, including you, with a purpose. So therefore, the person that I despise at one point in my life, when I fill my heart with the Holy Spirit, when I fill myself with the love of God, and I look at that person and I say, but, but God has something beautiful for that person. God instilled perfection inside that person and he wants to draw it out who am i to hinder that god bless you let's pray heavenly father thank you so much god for the message lord god thank you for giving us an opportunity to meet together lord and god please bless us throughout our week give us knowledge give us discernment Give us the wisdom to press forward and give somebody the word at just the right time. And let us please pick up each other and encourage. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night, everybody.